Hello. Just testing whether it is coming in YouTube live. Hello. Hello. Yes, Hello. it is coming. Hello. Hello, Srijata. Hello. Yeah. Hello. 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 Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Uh, hi. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Oh, hello. Hello. Yes, hello everyone. We'll start sharply at 7 p.m. So just give us another five minutes. Hello? Hello, hello, Srijata. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, so, live before time. Uh, thanks to both yeah, of them. Good, good evening. Good evening to all of you. Good evening, sir. Good Thank evening. you so good much. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, Dr. Bishas. Uh, can you hear me properly? Uh, yes, Mrs. Zatta. You're quite okay, audible. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Voice is loud and clear. OK, thank you.
Okay, so I think uh, we can get started now. Uh, 
so we are already also on youtube live uh, so my request would be that uh, you know please keep yourself muted if you are not speaking so that is the first request and you will have to uh, you know follow that for the entire session um sridhar ji am i audible uh, loud and clear ah uh, yes doctor ji okay okay thanks thanks Thank okay you. so good evening one and all on behalf of the organizing committee i dr shobdar shri goshami extend a very warm welcome on uh, today's international webinar on covid 19 emergent challenges and capacity building so we will start the proceedings uh, by playing an audio note from professor shipra halder who is a teacher in charge and chairperson iqac bangobashi morning college i hope uh, the screen is visible to the international webinar on covid-19 emerging challenges and capacity building i wish the webinar a grand success i hope through this webinar all participants will be benefited thank you uh, so may i now request uh, dr srijatha bishwas Uh, our iqac coordinator to deliver her keynote good evening good evening on behalf of iqac internal quality assurance cell of bangobashi morning college i welcome you all to the international webinar on covid-19 emerging challenges and capacity building we have never seen a pandemic before never experienced such stressful situation covid-19 is not only a major public health crisis but a crisis that has touched almost all sectors starting from education to industries agriculture to transport from real estate to tourism and as a result we are facing so many challenges the pandemic has forced all educational institutions in our country and in many others across the world to suspend physical classrooms and adopt online classes information and communications technology ict that used to play a supportive and complementary role in the teaching learning process before the pandemic has to play an obligatory role now but there are so many issues associated with online teaching learning including the availability of infrastructural facilities accessibility to digital devices networking and of course there is the question of data security at the other end due to prolonged lockdown millions of people have lost their jobs and salaries have been deducted for many others so there is a huge economic injury imposed upon the entire society at our personal levels in order to maintain social distancing we are trying to train ourselves to live in solitude but man is a social animal we need each other as a consequence 
we are suffering from anxiety, distress, and depression. So at this point of time, we need to seriously and carefully manage the stress that is building up with the spread of the pandemic. In these two days of our webinar, all these issues will be discussed by eminent speakers. And uh, it is now quite obvious that we have to survive, adapt, adjust, and thrive in the new normal mid-COVID and post-COVID environment. As author and tele-evangelist Robert Harold Schuller has said, problems are not stop signs, they are guidelines. We believe that our distinguished speakers will help us to identify the directions, the pathway that will lead us from darkness to light. It is not easy, but it is possible. So please come, let us make it possible. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, Srijita Biswas, for perfectly setting the context. Uh, you know, touching up on different perspectives, different phases that we are going through. So may I now request uh, Dr. Sriporna Taurofdar, uh, Assistant Professor from our Department of Hindi, to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Dr. Shabdashi. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Mrs. Piyandatta, a woman with enormous teaching experience. Mrs. Datta is in the teaching profession for the last 25 years. She had, she worked as a teacher for many years in two of the renowned Delhi public schools. DPS Gurgaon and DPS Mathura Refinery Nagar. Later, she also taught in the International Department of Rygaard School in Copenhagen, Denmark. For the last 14 years, she lives in England and has taught in many schools in London. At present, she works as a math specialist teacher in Berkshire, UK. Today, we are honored to have Mrs. Datta with us we are happy that she has consented to share her experiences in the teaching learning process during COVID-19. Thank you, ma'am, and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Taravdar. Good evening, everyone. Today I'm talking to you from the county of Berkshire in the United Kingdom, which is adjacent to London. I have been teaching for many years, and at present, I work as a math specialist teacher in the county where I live. I would like to share with you some of my experiences regarding the challenges faced in the educational institutions in COVID-19 situation. Please remember that all that I share with you today are totally my personal views. As you all know that we are passing through a precarious situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic and different countries of the world are passing through the COVID-19 peak phase at different points of time. Here in the UK, an almost co complete lockdown started from 23rd of March, 2020. I remember the build up to the situation. And as I traveled to my school, the week before the lockdown, I found the trains almost empty. At eight o'clock in the morning, busy London roads were nearly deserted. As I headed to my school, 
I was slowly getting surrounded by the fear of the unknown. By that point of time, COVID-19 cases were rising sharply in the United Kingdom and people were trying to learn more about their disease, how it spreads and what are the effects of the disease in the human body. Suddenly, meeting or talking to a fellow human became a matter of grave concern. At my school, where I work with an intelligent cohort of children, my role is to motivate and challenge them to achieve greater depth in maths. I found that many of them were aware of the disease. At that point of time, it was not explicit on how it affected the children. Assuming that the school closure was imminent, the teachers under the guidance of the leadership team were getting ready both resource-wise and technical facility-wise. We tried to explore innumerable websites and online resources which, could, which we could use in case of a school closure and children and teachers working from home. Children already had access to some educational websites where they could complete the tasks assigned by the teachers. Anxiety prevailed as if we are at war, but intentionally we didn't express our concerns in front of the children and maintained a happy and secure learning environment in the school. Children's mental health is of paramount importance in the United Kingdom. At the start of the lockdown, it was decided that we will be uploading work for the children on the school website every week. We had to keep in mind that the work sent home to the children should be pitched at the right level of difficulty for the children so that they would not bother their parents much in order to finish the task, especially when the parents were working from home and could be feeling stressed because of the pandemic. We continue to explore resources and share the information among all the teachers. Teamwork was very crucial. We started to set work on the websites where the children already had access so that they can complete their tasks easily. As a math specialist teacher, I tried to add some challenging extension work in maths along with the general work set for the children to find the appropriate resources like the right videos or the PowerPoints in order to explain the concepts to the children and also to find the activity sheets was tricky and time consuming. Accessibility to the curriculum for every child is also vital in the United Kingdom. Many children have limited access to digital devices. Therefore, delivering lessons through Google Classroom and Zoom was not a preferred solution in general throughout the education sector. BBC came forward with its program of homeschooling through BBC bite size. BBC bite size has 150 new lessons every week to keep the children on track with their learning. Children will find daily lessons for homeschooling in maths and English for every year group, as well as regular lessons in science, history, geography, and more. The homeschooling lessons have been created with teachers and other educational experts. 
They feature a mix of videos, animations, practice activities, quizzes, and games. The head and the senior leadership team kept in touch with all the staff each and every day during this challenging phase through emails, keeping up the morale of everyone and a constant source of appreciation. Throughout this period, parents were regularly updated about any changes in the curriculum and all other information. The teachers called all the children regularly to find out if they were okay during this phase of the pandemic and if they needed any help or found difficulty in completing the tasks. During one such call to the children, a child from my maths group informed me that a maths question set on the topic of measurement was not really workable. That particular question was given to assess the reasoning ability of the children, and in reality, it could not be solved. I was very happy to know that the children were working enthusiastically. I congratulated the child, and I was even more motivated to plan exciting and challenging lessons for the children. It is suggested that school closure for months could affect the mental health of the children. At present, some year groups have returned to school after much debate. They are working in small groups under the supervision of a teaching staff. Each group is referred to as a bubble, following the concept of the schools in Denmark. No more than 15 children can be in a bubble. The concept of the bubble is to facilitate social distancing. Strict social distancing and hygiene routines are placed very carefully in schools to take care of the safety of the children and all the staff. Hopefully, schools will be able to welcome all the children from September 2020. I wish everyone in the education sector and in general, the very best of health and mental strength to overcome the negative effects of this pandemic and flourish again as sensible, empathetic and resilient human beings. Thank you everyone for listening. Hello. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mrs. Datta, for your insightful speech. And uh, it's surely uh, education and uh, you know dealing with children is often more challenging than dealing with more grown-up students. Okay, so it was really enlightening to hear about the challenges and the uh, nice example that you gave where the problem didn't have any solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, I don't have uh, any uh, question from the particip participants as yet. Uh, so uh, my, one of my uh, question uh, will be that, uh, like, how do you, so how the children, as you are uh, you know, dealing with them firsthand, how they are dealing uh, with this, uh, this new situation? So, you know, keeping them occupied is one of the strategies that I see that you are adapting and also, Keeping them continuously in touch and communication loop is also one of the things that I see you are doing. Uh, but then how it is affecting? Are you seeing that most of the students are you know, coping well or how, how it is, ma'am? Uh, ma'am, you are muted. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, as you might know that the uh, lockdown is relaxed, so now they can meet their friends um, outside and also with one family inside uh, in their house. So uh, things are much better now. And uh, some children are back to school, like the reception year one, year six, children are back to school. And uh, what I understand is they are very happy to be back to school, but uh, they are following the new normal, as we call it, uh, 
So uh, yes, and they are uh, they are very happy. At least they can see their friends, even though uh, they are still maintaining the social distancing thing. So apparently, it's looking it's looking quite promising at present. Okay, okay. So thank you so much, ma'am, for taking your time out and addressing this uh, audience. Thank you so much, and I'm sure you know in future also there will be opportunities to interact with you. So once again, most uh, welcome, most welcome, welcome, Dr. Goshami. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, and all the best to all of you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Most welcome. Uh, now, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Atrey Boshu, our uh, head of the department, Department of Chemistry, to introduce the second. Thank you, Shaptarshi. Over to <clears throat> Thank you, Shaptarshi. It's my privilege to introduce Professor yes. Omlan Chakraborty in our webinar. Omlan Chakraborty is a full professor in the A.K. Choudhury School of Information Technology at the University of Calcutta. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Engineering, Princeton University, USA during 2011-2012. He has almost 20 years of experience in engineering education and research. He is the recipient of DST Boy Scout Fellowship Award in Engineering Science in the year 2011, Indian National Science Academy Visiting Faculty Fellowship in 2014, JSPS Invitation Research Award in 2016, Erasmus Mundus Leaders Award in 2017, Hamid Visiting Professorship from University of Cambridge, UK in 2018, and Shikha Ratna Award by Department of Higher Education, Government of West Bengal in 2018. He has also served in various capacities in various higher education organizations, both at national and international levels. He has published around 150 research papers in different journals and conferences and has graduated 12 PhD students. He is an associated editor of the Elsevier Journal of Computers and Electrical Engineering and guest editor of the Springer Journal of Applied Sciences. He is a senior member of IEEE and ACM, IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Visitor, Distinguished Speaker of ACM, Secretary of IEEE CEDA, India Chapter, Member of International Water Association, Vice President of Data Science Society and Life Member of CSI India. His areas of research are machine learning, computer vision, reconfigurable computing, cyber physical systems, VLSI, CAD, and quantum computing. I request uh, Dr. Chakraborty to kindly deliver his lecture. Thank you, Professor Basu, and uh, thanks to the organizers of Bangabashi Morning College for inviting me in this very august uh, conference. And I hope that uh, all the participants have enjoyed the first speaker, and she has, uh, she has highlighted very important issues regarding the school education system amongst the pandemic and what, uh, what needs to be done in the society at large. So my my lecture my my today's talk will be just a, just a particular aspect of uh, this pandemic scenario and uh, so how we can how we can look into one of the important aspect of pandemic scenario which is the uh, security and privacy uh, because all of us are all of us are uh, to so using the digital platforms in the different ways to to. Uh, to cater the requirement of uh, pandemic scenario, either either we are taking lectures or or our or our we are talking with the friends or we are our our kids are getting uh, getting their courses to the online platforms and and we are ordering food medicines all this to the online platforms. So 
so my lecture will give you some insights about what you mean by privacy and security in this online era and obviously what are the rules and checks okay being a being a common user of this uh, um, online domain and digital domain what are the common checks we have to maintain uh, though in terms of technology we we in the school of information technology university of calcutta we have very well established lab where we do research on cyber security and cyber physical systems uh, but thinking about uh, the audience which is having a mixed expertise in various domains so i will keep my lecture mostly limited to the to the issues and what are the what are the ways we can we can take care of the the privacy and security I'm not going into much on the technical nitty gritties so so before going into the privacy and security we have to know what is online the why when we call something online right so so something is called online normally when it is connected in the internet we we try to exchange information we try to we try to run some processes which can enable some services like like we can go to the go to the google pay and we can uh, do some online transfer we can we can go to our uh, bank uh, bank portals and we can log in and we can check our account informations we can uh, we can order order food to the services like swiggy we can we can book cabs we can we can go to buy our buy our all our daily needs uh, through amazon to offer all these things so so which means that there there are uh, there are large large range of services uh, and these services are getting increased and that's why and that's why more and more more and more people are getting are getting connected with this online platform right it can be on very various various fronts right and and obviously it is a very helpful device of communication or connectivity at the present era uh, we know that it gives you a immense opportunity of interaction and and now we know that if internet is not there in our in our home and we all all felt this during the uh, massive super cyclone uh, where where our internet internet services were disrupted and we and we just all we felt that we are not in our in our normal uh, in normal earth or normal habitat okay we are we are just isolated from each other right so so that's the that it, that's the uh, it has a facility what internet gives us in the in the today's uh, today's world and that's why that's why online platform is so interesting and online platform is so useful right but but what we are what we are becoming actually that okay we are becoming a sort of dependent to the online platform right for example for example if i if i want to want to communicate communicate with somebody i think i think many of us will will not rather uh, make a make a normal telephone phone call we will go with a with a digital call like a, like a google meet or or skype or whatsapp or something like that because because we feel that uh, that gives a better connectivity we can see the video we can listen to the audio and all the all the things we can have so, so what it actually means that we are getting more connected with this particular online world and that's and that's where where we need to have a have a very cautious step right otherwise otherwise we will see or or my lecture will will let you know that what are the what are the dangerous consequences this this online platform can lead to so if we uh, look into the online platforms obviously they are they are of different uh, different uh, varieties right though we though we tell all of them as online platforms but they are of different uh, they are they are catering or their technological uh, base is catering a different type of needs right so the most important or the or the most common online platform we know it's a uh, whatsapp linkedin facebook and okay, there are multiple uh, multiple this type of social networking sites uh, where we connect with our with our friends with our uh, family members with our students with our uh, professional colleagues and just and just try to try to exchange official or unofficial messages because they are they're pretty robust okay right we can we can transfer files we can transfer audio we can transfer video so it is 
is really a good utility to connect to connect with someone whom you want to uh, uh, want to communicate something. The another type of online platform is obviously are the computing platforms, right? Which are which are very heavily used by organizations, and I think uh, nowadays the, the the school, college, universities uh, they they will be they are they are thinking that whether whether they will be shifting to the computing platforms like cloud, uh, which gives the enormous opportunity of storing your data and and as well as uh, uh, processing the data. Okay, that means it can be your ERP system which is running in organization. It can be it can be a scientific scientific research. Uh, uh, computation for scientific research uh, uh, where you don't uh, where you don't have the have the uh, way to develop infrastructure in the first point of time. So what you do, you can hire a cloud and you can run your scientific computations and and uh, the many form of computation. So this is normally called the cloud, uh, which gives you a scope to uh, scope to store data as well as to process the data in uh, in a third party cloud vendor. Uh, cloud the uh, the platforms which are already there but which are coming in a very new new form due to this pandemic is something the online tutoring platforms and online meeting platforms right and we are today uh, today we all are meeting for the Google Meet right and we know that there is Zoom there is Microsoft Teams uh, they are evolving and they are shaping up and they are and they are. Due to this online, uh, due to this pandemic scenario, their user base is just uh, just just growing in an exponential way, right? And those are those are specialized platform which gives you gives the ability to connect and to and to and to cooperate and to collaborate in a very professional way. There are other platforms uh, uh, like like YouTube or, or TripAdvisor, which actually which can actually take. Uh, you take inputs from multiple sources and can and can post it and can post it in a particular public domain so that everybody can everybody can can use the content of that right again and and that can be a, that can be a sort of uh, sort of suggestions for your travel which is which is most common in the TripAdvisor type of uh, sites and there are also YouTube which can which can give very useful content and as well as there are some some bogus content also somebody can put in there. Right, so that uh, so people can watch. So, so somebody creates the creates the stuff and puts it into the puts it into the into the uh, uh, service of the server, and the others watches on it. So, so these are the that means obviously there are plethora of other type of platforms, but but if you just try to look into the online platform in the most general way, uh, these are the these are the most important or most important categories of online platforms which we commonly use. So now, so now, as we are into this digital era and we are communicating, we are transferring our inf important information through uh, through these online platforms. Uh, it's obviously what we need to know uh, is whether whether we are we are at par or we are maintaining the privacy and security when we are communicating with these online platforms. So, so before going into what are the what are the various aspects of this? Let's try to understand fundamentally what it means. So, so security fundamentally means that uh, there are some informations, right, which you which you don't want to uh, want to want to offer somebody who is not uh, not uh, not close to you, or not your not not your friend, or not that is there are some informations which you didn't, uh, which you which you don't want to pass to anybody. Right? Suppose you suppose your uh, banking passwords or your online transaction passwords or many of your many of your very core personal details. So it is called confidential information for you, right? And 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 security means that security means that that confidential info that is the that in the total digital platform what you are what you are using, your information will not go will not pass over to 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 unintended parties. So that your confidentiality, loss of confidentiality, will never happen. Privacy is the other aspect of that. So privacy means that you are you are you are sending some data to to some party, right? Right, and this data is used for a particular purpose. But this data can be used for some other purpose also, right? Suppose suppose you are registering in a bank. Right? Uh, don't uh, don't quote me or don't uh, uh, 
uh, they don't take me that I am giving an example of a bow of the bank just for a deliberate uh, way, but it's not like just to, just to make the things simple, I am giving an example of a bank. The banks, the banks are doing a great a great role in private business security. But just to give an example, I think it's better to use a bank because every everyone everyone of us uh, have uh, using the banking services and maybe digital. So so when you when you enter a banking service or register to a banking service, you have to give a lot of personal details of you, right? Your 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 age, your your occupation, your profession, your monthly salary, whether you have house, whether you have car, all these things, right? And this is and this is perfectly fine. Uh, uh, fine, uh, find the bank uses this data, right? And try to and and tries to and tries to fix your uh, uh, fix your uh, fix your customer rating or trying to or try to fix that. Uh, what are the what what are the services you can you can get? Okay, based on your uh, financial financial support, or based on your based on your personal uh, uh, personal credentials. Now, if this data goes to a goes to a real real estate agent, right, or a car company, right, or to anybody doing doing some other business, okay, they can use this data and they can influence influence you to to to, to get their business done. Right, and that is and that is a breaching of privacy, because the data what you have submitted to your bank was only meant for 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 your interaction with the bank, for your transactions with the bank, right? It doesn't it doesn't uh, need to go or it shouldn't go to 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 any other third party, right? And and bank will also not use for its own operation also. Except, except the transactions and the financial financial negotiations which the bank is doing with you. So this we should be very careful that this is what is called privacy. So, so what happens in a in a in a paper in a paper domain or or the or when I when they pass on our data in a paper, right? And when I pass the, when they pass the data to a digital platform, digital platform gives us a gives us a very b -b 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 very high, uh, very high benefit in terms of that. I remain connected wherever I am. Now I can, I can log into my bank. That whether I am in Kolkata, whether I am in US, whether I am, I am in, okay, uh, Punjab or Bombay somewhere. Okay, international, nationally, I can connect. I can log on. I can transfer the money to everywhere. So if this is online. So, but but if it was a paper. Then I have to come physically visit to the bank and I have to do the process. So, so I can only do it in a particular, a particular case or in a particular way. But online gives us a very, very large flexibility. Okay, that right in different day, time of the day in different uh, locations of the of the of the world, I can I can do the same thing. So this is a huge benefit. But with this benefit, uh, there comes a, a sort of uh, okay, say additional additional stuff. For which we have to be very careful. When you are moving the data from from point one to point two, it is not only point one to point two; it is actually multiple points. Right, your data is moving to multiple points, right? And and there is always an opportunity of somebody to pocket your data, right? And that's and that's what is very dangerous. So you don't know uh, that uh, uh, where your data is getting and 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 which pockets your data is getting filled, right? Unless you have a uh, very good knowledge uh, in terms of technology or your or your or your or your uh, say agent at the other end maybe a retail agent or maybe a bank agent they are very transparent they tell that okay that these are the, uh, the these are the ways i'm using your data so nobody tells like that right your your you know the social social networking sites and all these things they don't they don't tell that uh, what they're doing with your data and what are the what are, what are the ways they're storing your data so this is this is the dangerous part. That, you know, this is a dangerous uh, scenario which can which can lead to dire consequences in the in your in your online domain, and that's and that's what is I am I am trying to point in this particular lecture, right? Okay. So so obviously when we are when we are trying to when are trying to look into the issues of privacy and security, we are trying to trying to make it as a okay. It's unified, unified structure it means privacy and security goes hand in hand. You cannot tell that okay, hey, I have a privacy, I don't have security, or I have a security, I don't have privacy. It doesn't mean means, uh, means anything to me for a for a 
for a normal consumer to a particular internet service or online service, it means that the service should have both privacy and security. So as I told, the privacy and security are just, are just the, the mirror of one another, right? So, so, so they should go hand in hand. And, and there are examples where you can tell that, okay, that means in one example, suppose the first example I have given, it means that it means that your data, your confidential data, and that means is used by the bank in a very good way, which means they they are not divulging it to any other third party. Uh, they are they are using a very a very secure secured means of communication to 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 take your data or to or to transfer your data, which means that your data is protected and your, both your security and privacy privacy remains, right? And as I told that your privacy gets compromised when the banks or when you are in retail uh, retail service where you have given a lot of information personal, professional, and other informations, they are they're disclosing this information to any third party, right? If they're if they're disclosing this information in any third party, it means it is a loss of privacy. And suppose suppose your 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 server, right? Your, your retail server, so, okay, that means say Amazon, say, say Groffer, say, uh, say Uber, Ola, Bank, these servers are weak, right? This server, the servers doesn't have a very good security policy. Suppose I'm just giving you a scenario, and and there is a there is a hacker who gets into the server server of your of your of your service providers and get the get the data get the data of the customers, right? And that uh, which means okay, right? And this data get, this data means all the all the all the secured transaction informations, right? And then and the and then it is means uh, that uh, that means that they have uh, they have breached the security and your security is is gone for a toss. So so that's the scenario where uh, where your both security and privacy gets uh, it gets totally uh, it totally destroyed, right? And and that shouldn't happen. So so you should you should look into that that the data where the servers are being maintained, your your data and the servers where your data is maintained, they are the secure servers and they are. And they are fine to to handle any sort of security challenges. So, uh, so especially especially in the in this in this in this phase of uh, what we are what we're going into that is a pandemic phase of the pandemic phase of COVID nineteen, we see that there is a mushrooming of cyber attacks because because we are we are working in our own house and we are we are. Uh, we are mostly confined, but it doesn't confine the attackers, right? And this, and this, there is a the, the sharp rise in digital in digital usage for for everybody. That means uh, uh, people people at home, people people at office, uh, students at the school, all all are now instead of their own locations, they are now now using the digital space to 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 get their work done. Right, and that and that influences, or that actually uh, gives a good impetus to the uh, to, to the attackers, right? Uh, to the to the uh, to the to the people who who wants to who wants to steal steal the things from you, and those are called cyber attacks. And and we have seen that there are uh, there there are heavy uh, that is uh, there are heavy predictions as well as data in support of that. That ninety two percent ninety two percent cyber attacks will be done on individual. Right, eighty-seven percent are basically data privacy. So your data will will go into wrong hands, and and you don't have any control how they will be used. Right, and it and it and it shouldn't be only only text data. It can be audio, it can be video, it can be images. Right, and that leads to leads to more dangerous consequences of privacy. And 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 this particular this pandemic scenario where people are a bit shaky, uh, yeah, people people has lost their confidence in some way. Uh, people are forced to get into get into their work done in the digital domain. This gives a, this gives a more more vulnerable uh, vulnerable sort of uh, vulnerable uh, scenario landscape, uh, which uh, uh, which is very beneficial for these attackers. So, so I will I will just uh, uh, try try to expose you to 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 some of the some of the threats which are which are very well known, uh, but uh, just to be, just to give you a sort of sort of guideline what you uh, when you go into this type of applications what are the, the what what are the possible threats that the background can have so that you are very and that means you try to try to work in a in a more cautious and a safe way. So the 
So the most important is the email because we know that email is so so important for all of us. We 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 communicate. We we send our official documents and we and we and we uh, 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 try. Uh, okay, uh, this email email is is the platform, and there are various uh, various email services uh, which we use. Okay, one uh, but the one person uses maybe three four different types of email services. So so the way it works the the threat in the email service is obviously the malicious emails, uh, which can be of many types. Okay, which can which can be phishing, which can have a malware, uh, we, which can give you a very. Uh, 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 the, I was I was I was just I was just actually uh, uh, discussing with uh, with one of the one of the forums very recently, which happened in ABP Anand, and uh, and where but I also gave a small a small bite. So so there. Uh, and SBI is warning everybody that there can be an email which comes at COVID-19 test. So which means that people are now rushing to rushing to have their COVID-19 test done, right? And 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 the attackers have uh, have actually captured that particular sense of the sense of the community and have dedicatedly are dedicatedly uh, uh, sending the spam emails which contains COVID-19 test and maybe an unknown. Uh, maybe a uh, maybe a person who don't know about this threat scenario uh, 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 voluntarily goes to that uh, goes to that uh, clicks that clicks that email, uh, uh, thinking that there is some there is some scheme which is offered by uh, by government or some organization organization to 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 have your COVID nineteen test done. Now, once he or she clicks that email, okay, that can be very dangerous because there can be. There can be a zombie process which can which can get downloaded and which can which can transfer all of your data to a backend server. That can be a, that can be a malware which can which can lock your uh, lock your computer systems in some way and can and can ask a ransom that that hey that if you want to start up your computer you need to pay me the ransom so that you can you can again start your computer or you can work the computer normal way. Right, so so these are the these are different scenarios, and there are and there are other types of mail, very lucrative mail. Suppose, uh, but this, 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 suppose mail comes that okay, there is a very good job offer for you, right? And in the online, as the as the jobs are in a in a in a downtrend, and the people are searching for jobs, searching for they're searching for the professions. Uh, so there can be lucrative mail that hey, there is a job for you. You just give your some of your details, right? Some of your and. And, and unknowingly, it will pass all the details of you, and that can be that can be very dangerous. That can be a, a image of you can be created. So this is called the phishing. What I what I tried to tell you is that getting 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 an important data out of you with some sort of with some sort of mask. Okay, mask. Uh, uh, the, the attacker wears a mask and and tries to behave like your behave like your friend and tries to get a very important information out of you, and that is called a phishing. So. So these are these are the vulnerabilities which can happen in the in the domain of email. There's another which is called web tracking, right? Which means that there is a silent observer. Whatever you are doing in the web, okay, whatever whatever processes you are running, whom you are communicating, okay, they are they are tracking it silently. This majorly happens when 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 you browse the sites which are untrusted, okay, the sites the sites which are which are not well encrypted. Uh, where information gets out of that, right? So, that, that, and also, and also, there are, there are sites which which pour cookies on your on your on your computer. So, cookies cookies are nothing but some processes, right? Which are being which are being controlled by the server end, controlled by the server end, but runs in your machine, right? This is this is normally done for some good purpose. Some of the good sites also have their cookies because because that enables you to get some of their services because whenever you you connect to that particular server. The cookies enables you to automatically connect to some to some standard services, but it can be dangerous. Which means that that cookies are some are some sort of software processes which runs in your computer, but they're controlled to the server, the server at the other end, right? And these cookies can can actually track all the operations you are doing when you are connected online, right? And this and these operations can be now diverted to some third party, and that is called web tracking. The privacy threats are obviously one of the thing, and that is a data collection. So this is this is called integrity integrity type of attack, right? And there are and there are also some scenarios, especially in the in the case of social sites, 
okay the, when we when we try to try to respond to the social sites we give a lot of informations okay, of ourselves right and we don't know that whether there is any silent a silent observer who is collecting your data right and he's trying to do some harm of you very there are examples where where people where burglars have have gone into the home just just collecting the data that, that the person has has browsed a google map okay in a in a location maybe 100 miles from his current uh, from from his or her home, her home right and and that data has been collected by a burglar and 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 the burglar knows that now the now the person is 100 miles or 200 miles away from the home and, and then an attack can be physical attack can be done right and these data can be this data can be just unknowingly uh, thrown into the social website uh, of uh, where you unknowingly have given it a private uh, public access so so anybody know that where you are what you are doing and they and they can actually take the collect the data and they can do it do, do many may many harm for you so the so the good point is that uh, try to try to work mostly privately don't uh, don't make all your data public in your in your online domain and and don't and don't trust the trust the apps which are very lucrative which tells that uh, uh, this is a free app this will give a lot of services to you but you don't know that once the free apps get downloaded uh, what are the data collection services they automatically start this is another issue that whenever you are we're getting into a website it is it is suggested that you should you should see whether the website is 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 working with the latest encryption standard so so if the website is not working with the latest encryption standard which is called https or it is a uh, secured uh, secure type of uh, okay uh, secure transaction sites then you are at a risk whenever you are doing online banking whenever you are you are you are sending a very uh, uh, very important information to a particular form which goes to, uh, to to another 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 server or another application you should be you should be very sure that uh, that your application is an HT, https application okay instead of a very simple http because the https application is basically a sort of uh, secure secure socket layer type of application i'm not going into the technical job that but this application means that this particular website has a certificate from an international standard organization okay this certifies that this particular the security imbibed in this web web application is of the highest quality so that so that actually gives you a promise that whatever data you are exchanging through this website or through the web application uh, doesn't get into wrong hand okay so, so that you have to remember and the, and the transactions you uh, you are trying to do or or you are doing in your online uh, there's a golden rule or thumb rule you have to follow that that should be https site there are also some threats uh, because in the today's environment we are connected connected by multiple devices it's not only one phone it's 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 my my phone my laptop uh, my Wi-Fi dongle and maybe my television all are connected with the with the same network in the same Wi-Fi network so so now you may have invested a lot to make your uh, uh, make your computer very good make your make your security in the computer good but we haven't invested or or we haven't gone through the that means uh, might be you don't know that means you're not aware at all that that a television which is also also having an online service or a mobile phone, which is also having an online service, and all they are connected to the same Wi-Fi, uh, uh, they are vulnerable uh, because we haven't taken proper measures of of security in that. And what happens is that in a connected world, if 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 one door is weak, right, and maybe your other other doors are strong, but still that weak door can behave as a trap door or a back door uh, for a for 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 a uh, for an attacker who okay, wants to. Breach your privacy or security and can and can and can get into the, your your strong doors also. So you have to be have to be very cautious that that in your organization, in your college, in your in your institution, when you are making a particular web application on, um, maybe your students and faculties are connected to the application. Okay, it is it is it is not a one computer system uh, which delivers that particular. Uh, I think all the systems which which helps to deliver, uh, support that application 
uh, should be equally equally protected in terms of security and privacy. Last but not the least, though it is not very uh, very contextual at the present scenario, uh, because we are mostly in our house, we are not going into public places. But but uh, but but, uh, but normally that means in a in a very in normal scenario, we know that we are very we are very happy when we see that in a in a in my restaurant or in my airport or in a hotel, I get a free Wi-Fi lounge, and we are very happy that hey, I have got got something free, and that is very good. So. So now start uh, start doing transactions in this public Wi-Fi. So the problem in the public Wi-Fi is that as it is offered free, they invest very very less, right? And it is your risk, right? And then, then that means so uh, so they don't invest much on the on the security services of their of their of their of their uh, uh, server, right? And that's why those servers are most vulnerable servers. And and the attackers also tries to tries to span these public Wi-Fi networks. Right and tries to uh, tries to have a free path of attacking uh, the the users who that is who have in a in a in a very good mode have connected to the uh, connected to the public Wi-Fi, right? And so and so if you are if you are getting into your organizational organizational email or your or your very important important email uh, or your very important transactions online, okay, uh, this can. Uh, uh, this can lead to very dangerous consequences, and there are and there are uh, yeah high number of cases which has been reported uh, that uh, the security security attack or 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 cyber attacks in the networks which are in the public Wi-Fi domain. So the best way the best way when you are connected into a Wi-Fi, there's a technique called VPN, where if where many of the informations are doesn't doesn't goes into the next layer of your network. Right, and that's and that's the good policy to keep your keep your system hidden, okay, in a network. Um, though you can uh, the, though you can access most of the services. And I'm, obviously, I've already briefed this. Uh, so, social networking is a is a is the thing for our life nowadays. We uh, we exchange data, we get connected. We can know that means if one of my friend is in is in good or in a bad state and and, and try uh, to help him or her, but 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 if we if we try to try to become very uh, uh, do some do some okay exaggeration of our of our of our data uh, data and of our of our uh, okay, personal information, then that can be have very dire consequences. So, uh, so people people try to tell everything what what he or she is doing at this point of time, wh where he or she is at this point of time, what he or she will be doing next point of time in the social network, right? And 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 if the profile is public, right? And the, and, the, and most of the information is public, then it, then it is really a really a great threat. So so don't do that. Don't do in that way. Uh, try to uh, try to restrict the data communication within your very close friends group. Uh, try to make a lot of the things private uh, so that any anybody cannot cannot get into your whereabouts. So now I go to the uh, I go to the what are the so what I have tried to try to tell you is the what are the different scenarios and we can discuss a lot many more scenarios. But due to limitation of time and due to uh, just to give you a, a brief introduction and just to uh, just to uh, make all of you aware of the scenarios. I try to give you some some example scenarios. Now let us uh, see that what what a common a common people can do, what a common person can do, right, to protect your security and privacy. So as I have already already told and repeated uh, that uh, that personal information in the social media should be limited, right? You shouldn't you shouldn't um, uh, give the information which is uh, which can be very close to you. Right? What is your what is your medical uh, uh, what is your medical status? Okay, it's very dangerous. Right? If you if you try to discuss that, okay, these are the, these are the medicines or drugs I am using, or these are the they can they can trace not many things. If you if you give your financial status, okay, in your in your in your social network, okay, it, it's very dangerous thing. So, so that's that's the most important important part. You don't give your location. Don't uh, uh, don't pass very very very. very uh, uh, important images or video 
or audio which can be which can be uh, taken and can uh, and can backfire you this is the very standard ways and and try to try to use the online in the in the private mode in the incognito mode uh, that will the, that might look you that you are you are a little bit uh, uh, skeptic of the of the usage but that can pre that can prevent prevent you to prevent you from much more dangerous consequences right and whenever you are looking into a website you try to see some of the recommendations which are the, which are the other users have uh, have gone to the website check the security status see the encryption standard and then only depend on the website and can and can start your services and kind of work on your services okay the urls and and that's so whenever you have any doubt in the online whenever you see some some very funny thing happening in your website or or your web service something something which is very skeptic something which is not uh, not very natural you you just you just log out from the service and just get disconnected because that's the uh, that's the way you should you should behave there's a little if there's a little signal of of some of some wrongdoing you should you should be very aware and you should you should take an immediate step and obviously it's not your only computer whatever digital devices are connected in a network uh, that should be protected okay and as i told virtual private network is a very good way when you set up your set up your wi-fi network in your organization or or Okay, it is better to be, better to work in a VPN mode, right? And and always maintain a clean machine. Your software should be updated. Your your security security add-ons should be very latest. You should have a good antivirus uh, system, uh, security system being laid in all the systems in the in the organization level as well as in the personal level. Uh, a clean machine is always good, right? That all the software should be should be from from an authorized vendor. Don't don't purchase softwares which are from unauthorized vendors. It can come cheap, it can come free in some cases, but that can lead to very dangerous consequences. So, so as we are in the online learning platform, you should you should have a proper orientation of the online learning platform because it is new. Though we are exposed to a lot of online platforms, online online platforms in the in our day to day world, but but learning platform is something which is very new to all of us, right? It, it's both for the both for the learners as the students and both for the faculties who are creating the content and delivering the content. And and as and as the content is very valuable, you shouldn't you shouldn't only depend on the online platform. You should have your own copy of the of the of the content. There is a two-factor authentication process, which actually is that it is a first authentication is through your secure user ID. And your password, and your and your second authentication process is through a particular uh, okay, say an ID which comes through a particular mail ID of yours, and through that you again or a or a phone, okay, it's sort of an OTP uh, which you have to again give to to have a connectivity. This may be a time con time consuming, and you might uh, get a little bit. Uh, uh, agitated that why I have to do so many things for my uh, for getting into a login. This is good for you because because this two-way authentication means something is it is not that you are giving something to the server and server is just checking that it is a both-way communication it means you are giving something to the server server is giving something to the you and and then you again repeating the server so it's a complete complete cycle where the server can fully check uh, check your authentication and check your check your security uh, security criteria and can and can give you the access right so, so last but last but not the least, that is after doing all these things, after knowing knowing the scenarios, after 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 maintaining some standard procedures, uh, still this still this uh, cyber crime, uh, cyber crime, the people who does cyber crime, they're uh, the, the, uh, they're very cunning. Uh, they are they are very improved in terms of technology. Uh, still, you can get attacked, right? If you get attacked, okay, that means and that means you have to report immediately to your organization because that means obviously thinking that your 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 online processes was your organizational activities. So so if you get if you get attacked in your in the online course, online curriculum, online activity, you should report to the to the head of the organization, your administrator, so that they have some steps to be taken at their end. Uh, Close all the accounts where you have seen that there is a breach, 
close all the accounts, uh, delete all those accounts because that can that can create some new load for other accounts. And obviously, obviously, you have to let uh, this look into unauthorized access. If somebody some new new message comes in your mail from a very unknown from from not your not your uh, not from anyone who is known to you, or a or a message comes in your in your in your uh, social uh, social messaging site, somebody somebody who's not of not of your friend, don't uh, it don't. Uh, b b the, Think it is a risk, and accordingly you try to you try to get out of that particular account, right? And obviously there is always a local police and 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 your and your federal government who who has very standard procedure laid up uh, for what you need to do, what are the what are the legal legal steps you can take, and and communicate with the cyber crime cell to 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 uh, to, uh, to, uh, to deal this particular uh, deal this particular scenario where you are a victim. Last but not the least, uh, the the suggestion is that stop means when you when you just when you just want to get into a particular online service, don't just rush. Take your time. Stop. Think that think that what what is the service I'm logging into? What what is the URL I'm logging into? Try to get some data that whether the URL is safe, whether your friends tell that the service is good. Right, and taking all this information, taking all all the background details, you should connect, because because the virtual road is very dangerous because you don't know who is your attacker. Right, in a in a in a real road, you know that a car is coming or a man is hitting towards you. Right, and you can know how many persons or how many how many people are there. Here, it is an uncounted number of uh, number of threats, and 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 you work with the shadows. So. So that's why it is more dangerous, and and it is more dangerous in the present scenario of pandemic. And so, so be safe. Uh, do your do your online connectivity in a very safe and secure way. Try to maintain the golden standards. That's all from my end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, presentation and. Uh, you know, uh, it is not a choice right now. So we are all uh, confined in our homes. So we need to do our activities. We need to transact, and uh, we need to do our whatever uh, usual activities that we can do currently. So there is a lot of questions that has come up, as usual, because you know it is so sensitive area and touches uh, all our life, uh, right? So I'll just try to summarize the questions. Okay, so some questions are. From transaction point of view, okay. So uh, if you are using phone pay, Google Pay, or Amazon Pay, okay. So what kind of security? How much of them are secure or not? So that is one of the one type of questions, and they've extended like uh, if their debit card information can be hacked, and and uh, like that. And there are some questions from the education side that you know which are the safe software. Is uh, uh, Zoom a safe software? How can we take exam? And 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 stuff like that. So so in summary, these are the main questions. Okay, okay. Just I will uh, try to answer those questions, Dr. Goshami. A very good questions. First of all, I think the audience has gone through my lecture, and so so something is some uh, some good issues have come up their mind. Thank you all. So the first question is obviously during the transactions, right? In the in the transactions, my suggestion is that you try to disclose the minimum information, right? First of all, first of all, obviously these services are very well-known services: Google Pay, uh, PayPal, and all these pay phones. So, so there is nothing, nothing much, much about this. But the only thing is that you try to, you try to, don't, don't make uh, some of the things which are automatic. And many of the people actually give their credit card information in such a way and make that it is a default information, right? So that. So that each time anybody can get into your get into your account. Suppose somebody gets into your account, and if your credit card information is a default information to the account, then he has a very easy way. So so don't keep the things default. You try to enter each of the time transactions your details. So that is each of the time you try to enter. Don't put that uh, put the information as a default. Uh, that will help you a bit because 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 then you have to whenever you connect with the services you have to enter that otherwise nobody can they can get into the information and can and can do the transaction right and obviously whenever this epa services comes up 
you try to use the EPS services which are highly recommended, which are being used by a large number of users. So, so some new EPS services come and they can give a very lucrative offer to you that, hey, we give a 10%, 25% discount to all of your purchases. Don't jump into that. Uh, look into the look into the uh, look into the b b feedbacks of the look into the customer size of the services and and also look into that whether the banks whether the good banks and your and the government support those services. If if it is, it means that there are several several organizations have tested their security and and have give them a good uh, b b good recognition and that's why that's why they are there. So so two things. For the services, first of all, you don't you don't uh, give the information automatic. Don't make all your informations uh, that is okay, that is already being default. Especially the credit card, debit card informations. Don't give a automatic choice of transaction for the cards in those services. Each time you want to uh, go for a payment, you enter your all details on your own, right? Secondly, secondly, for the online platforms and for the education platforms. That means I will always prefer the the tools and the systems which are from uh, big global entities, okay, like Microsoft, like uh, like Cisco, like uh, like uh, like Google. I'm not I'm not telling their uh, telling the telling the exact softwares, but I'm just trying to trying to tell that we should we should always depend on the on the on the on the on the products which are which are developed by 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 age-old uh, uh, strong companies, okay, because because you know that a uh, strong companies or a or a companies at the top, they have a they have an excellent excellent way of quality control, which takes a there is a large amount is the is the security and privacy aspect of the software. That means and also if you find if you find in any of any of the services has some has some bad comments, some negative comments coming up. Right, you should immediately reject the service. So I'm not naming any services, but I think that my directions, what I tried to give you, is very clear to all of you. The services you try to connect should be from the pioneering brands, first of all. Secondly, if you if you have at least 10% or 20% of the community who are telling that, hey, look that this service, this service has done something wrong, then obviously you should blacklist. Them back to the service immediately because because at least there are some examples that the service has created some nuisance. So I think that means I have made my point to all of you. Thanks once again, sir, for uh, answering these questions and of course uh, taking your time out. And I know you do quite a cutting edge research in the domain of security. So thanks for breaking it down so that, you know, we have a, we have a DRD of projects. So the faculties and the students who are interested in the domain of science and engineering, we have the DRD of project and uh, in our lab. And we are also also doing some innovative activities in the domain of security in terms of quantum quantum security and all these things. And Shaptoshi knows very well what is happening there. Yeah. Thanks. Shaptoshi. Yeah. Th thank you, sir. Uh, so may I uh, may I now request uh, Srimothi Momita Sharkar uh, Shamonto Ma'am, uh, HOT Department of Commerce, to introduce our final and third speaker of today's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Shaptoshi Goswami. Good evening to all. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Shurojit Dash. Dr. Shurojit Dash teaches at Center for Economic Studies and Planning, School of Social Science, Jawaharlal Nehru University. His areas of interest are macroeconomics, econometrics, public economics, and macroeconomic policy. Before joining JNU, he worked with Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, Wealth Finance Commission of India, Planning Commission of India, Kerala State Planning Board, National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, and Ambedkar University. He has published several research papers in national and international journals and books. He also writes in several widely spread newspapers, including Anandabajar Potrika. So requesting Dr. Dash to deliver his lecture on COVID-19, lockdown and its economic impact. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to, am I audible? Is the voice clear? 
Yeah, very clear. Can sir. I hear very clear. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, I would like to uh, extend my gratitude to Bangabashi College for organizing this program. And uh, I would like to thank particularly uh, Dr. Nilanjan Patro for having me in the list of speakers. Uh, it's a nice opportunity to share some of my views uh, on, the, on the economic impact of COVID lockdown. OK, uh, so let me begin by discussing briefly the pre-lockdown situation of Indian economy a little bit. Then it would be easier for us to contextualize this lockdown and its economic impact. Uh, before the lockdown, Shaptarshi, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, how much time do I have? You it's 8.15 in my watch. Yeah, it's, it would take your time, sir, comfortably. I mean, it's OK. Uh, should I speak for half an hour, and then it would be question answer, or what, or what is the format yeah, like? I think, yes, I think you know if you restrict to be may, maybe 25 minutes and five minutes for question answer, that would be probably better. Uh, so I have to finish by uh, 8.40, is it? Yeah. Yes, around, around 8.40. OK, OK, OK. okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, uh, yeah, let me briefly discuss the pre-lockdown situation of Indian economy. You know, uh, I mean, we all know that 2017-18 uh, uh, data on employment, unemployment, which nowadays is called uh, PLFS survey, uh, periodic labor force uh, survey, uh, that has uh, brought out the fact that unemployment rate in India uh, has become very high in fact, highest in 40 years period or something like that. We all know that inequality was growing at a very fast rate. And the GDP growth rate was falling quite sharply from more than uh, 7 to 8 percent per annum to less than 4 percent, uh, even according to the official data. Many people are skeptical about these GDP numbers. So some of the economists have actually argued that uh, growth rate uh, has come down even lower than 4%, uh, which was projected by the Central Statistical Organization for the uh, last quarter of last fiscal year, that is 2019-20. Now, uh, investment rate, I think uh, many people have pointed this out also that particularly non-food credit offtake from the commercial banks as proportion of GDP came down quite sharply. So the investment rate or the private investment rate in the economy was coming down quite sharply before the lockdown. Now, this was happening in a situation where profitability, private investment obviously would depend on the profitability, Profitability was coming down in almost all the sectors in the economy, primary, secondary, as well as in tertiary. And as a result of that, private investors were skeptical about making investment, whether this is the right time to invest or not, because they have to borrow money uh, from the banks and other financial institutions. And it has a cost. I mean, uh, no money is free. So they have to pay the interest rate, the lending rate, and so on. So they were not very sure whether their net profit after paying the interest rate on the uh, borrowed on the on the loan amount and uh, after paying taxes to the government, whether their net profit rate would be uh, high enough or positive uh, or lucrative enough for making investment or not. So in that kind of a situation, many people like me uh, were arguing that uh, this has happened because of contraction in aggregate demand in the economy. Uh, since inequality was growing at a very fast rate, uh, I was checking some of the data uh, of on wage rate from the Labor Bureau Shimla. Uh, they conduct surveys on regular basis every month uh, of 5,000 villages to understand the rural wage rates in the economy for I think 12 agricultural and 13 non-agricultural activities. The real rural wage rates were not growing at all for last five to six years uh, when per capita GDP was rising at a rate of more than 5% per annum. So maximum people earn these wages. 
they are either agricultural or non agricultural employees in uh, rural areas uh, their wage rates in real terms were not going at all for 5 6 years and per capita gdp was continuously growing at more than 5% rate so obviously it is not difficult to imagine the inequality was increasing at a very fast rate even as far as urban wages are concerned uh, the annual survey of industry data reveals that uh, urban wage rates also or uh, wage rates in organized manufacturing and some services uh, that was also not growing at a very fast rate in real terms so as a result of that share of wages in total value added was coming down and since maximum people in the economy maximum economic agents earn wages uh, they, they are not uh, capitalists or they are not uh, profit earners uh, as a result of uh, this uh, fall in share of wages as a proportion of total value added uh, the inequality in the economy was uh, going at a very fast rate maximum number of people uh, their income were not rising on an average but the aggregate uh, income or national income was rising at a substantially fast rate so uh, i mean wealth was getting concentrated in very few pockets and we know that when inequality uh, grows when uh, the there is a shift of income distribution from the poor to the richer section of population aggregate demand comes down and as a result of that we were uh, witnessing less profitability in almost all the sectors as a result of that investment was coming down growth rate was coming down and unemployment rate, rate was going up so that was the situation before uh, lockdown then this lockdown happens in the last week of march and uh, we know uh, i mean lockdown was announced within 4 hours notice and it was quite a uh, draconian drastic lockdown uh, which uh, took place in india as compared to many other countries and uh, we all know the stories of migrant workers also they got stuck wherever they were working when we talk about these migrant workers i mean we have all uh, seen their horrible pictures in the media and their stories and so on and so forth uh, as far as this migration is concerned i was looking at the data uh, as far as migration in india is concerned according to that is the latest available data according to 2011 census data one report came out from the ministry of urban affairs and housing in 2017 they analyzed that data according to that data the total size of migrant population in india is around uh, 37.5 crore today so it's huge I am not talking only about uh, the uh, you know migrant workers, but I am talking about all kinds of migration. Migration because of marriage, migration because of shifting of families, including everything. Now, if we keep aside all those that migration, I mean, uh, I think uh, seventy percent of uh, female migration happens because of marriage. So, uh, if we keep uh, and fifty, almost forty-nine to fifty percent of total migration happens because of marriage. So, uh, if we keep aside those things, and if we consider just migration because of uh, work and studies and business purposes, the total size of the migrant population in India would be something around twelve crore. Now, these twelve out of these twelve crore people, some people migrated within zero to nine years and some people migrated for more than 10 years so 10 years or more uh, for uh, if we uh, assume that those who have migrated for more than 10 years they are relatively well settled in their new places then also uh, the 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 size of the migrant population who migrated within zero to nine years would be something around five to six crore in india now, this does not necessarily mean the migration from rural areas to urban areas or from small villages to the big cities like Delhi or Hyderabad or Calcutta and so on. Uh, this migration is uh, inclusive of all kinds of migration, rural, rural migration, rural, urban migration, urban, urban migration and so on and so forth. 
when uh, we talk about urban areas uh, immediately what we think is we think of cities big cities but uh, 40% population in india lives in urban areas urban doesn't mean cities urban doesn't mean only the state capitals and the uh, metro cities urban means even the suburban areas even the uh, you know uh, semi urban areas small towns district headquarters everything so uh, including all these 40% of or more than 50 crore people in india lives in urban areas now uh, this migrant population 5 to 6 crore people uh, who migrated uh, to different places for work business and studies they were desperate i mean some of not all of them but at least 50% of them were desperate to come back because uh, there was no job obviously in the new places so uh, they could not run their families and also uh, for the migrant students etc uh, the institutes uh, didn't want to take any responsibility so they were asked to go back home and there was complete lockdown uh, interstate migration was almost impossible even intrastate migration was very difficult initially within the same state migrants could not uh, i mean uh, go to their go back to their uh, home uh, i mean uh, villages or, or or their hometowns so that was the situation uh, where uh, we all have uh, seen from the media that uh, the horrible stories which came up because of this uh, drastic lockdown completely uh, imposed completely in unplanned manner within 4 hours notice uh, i of course support uh, this lockdown because there was no other option however probably it would have been done in a little more planned manner and probably some options could have been given to the people particularly migrant population to go back to their hometowns and villages at least uh, uh, lockdown could have could have imposed probably uh, with a notice of uh, 48 hours or so so that would have made uh, things much more easier as compared to uh, what we have witnessed so that was about the migrant now i would like to emphasize on one more thing that is uh, the composition of labor force or the workforce in india as far as the composition of workforce in india is concerned according to sam plfs 2017-18 survey the total size of the workforce in india is around 37 to 38 crores now in plfs survey the total uh, population was underestimated is it was estimated to be 107 crore but um, i mean according to census projections the total population would be something around 130 crore today so if we um, increase that size of the workforce in the same ratio then the total size of the workforce in india today would be around 44 crores 43 to 44 crores out of that less than 10 crore workers are basically regular salaried employees either in private sector or in public sector or government sector and uh, more than 75 percent of the uh, total workforce uh, or almost 80 percent of the total workforce are either self-employed of various kinds and or casual workers so they don't have any kind of job security and they were the worst sufferers of this lockdown these small businessmen these uh, shopkeepers these uh, electricians plumbers and uh, whatever we can think of uh, i mean hundreds of occupations are there so most of them are casual laborers either casual laborers or self-employed people that is the structure of our workforce and we also know that uh, most of our workforce are engaged in informal sector or unorganized sector where there is no labor law where uh, there is no minimum implementation of minimum wage norms nothing so they earn very less i was calculating the average wage rate of uh, rural urban male female uh, self employed people casual workers as well as the weighted average as well as of uh, the salaried employed in india it came out to be less than 10000 rupees per month this is according to 2017 18 so today uh, it would not exceed probably 
the average weighted average wage rate would not exceed probably 11 to 12,000 12, per month for the workers in India. So this is the scenario in which this is the scenario in which we are operating uh, in this part of the world. Now here after the lockdown, many people have argued that uh, since most of the casual workers and uh, majority significant part of the self-employed people have lost their em employment and the earnings because of the lockdown, uh, th their purchasing power came down uh, quite drastically. And because of the lack of purchasing power, anyway, they were earning very less, most of them. Uh, in fact, uh, according to the consumption expenditure survey, uh, consumption expenditure data was not released by the government uh, for the year 2017-18. We have the latest consumption expenditure data of 2011-12. But if we make some projection according to the rural and urban uh, inflation rates in consumer prices, then I was roughly calculating that 50% of our rural population uh, let's say if the average household size uh, uh, is assumed to be five, if there are five members on an average in every family, then 50% of the rural households in India, they manage their families within 8,000 rupees per month. And 50% of urban population in India, they man their family expenditure per month would be less than 13,000 rupees. And if we, even if we consider 80% of the rural population, the consumption ex family consumption expenditure per month is around, uh, if I remember correctly, 12,500 rupees. And for urban uh, India, uh, it would be, for 80% population, it would be less than 20,500 rupees per month. So, uh, I mean, most of us uh, claim ourselves to be middle class people, but we are not actually middle class people in this country. We belong to, all of us uh, probably pay the direct taxes and only 3% population pays direct taxes in this country, income tax. So including our family members, it would be maximum 15 to 20% of the total population. So we belong to the top 20% population of this country and 80% population they live in a situation with the monthly family consumption expenditure of in urban areas 20,500 or less, in rural areas uh, 12,500 or less. So already people's purchasing power uh, was very low. On top of that, they have lost their earnings due to lockdown. As a result of that, the aggregate demand shrunk like anything. In fact, two of our PhD scholars in JNU, they are conducting one, uh, this uh, survey uh, to uh, among the middle class and upper middle class people to understand the depression in demand. They were asking people whether people had any plan of consuming any uh, consumer durable items like fridge, TV or uh, computer and so on and so forth or they had any plan of uh, you know, booking any flat or real estate or land, purchasing land and so on, or they had any plan of domestic travel and whether they are postponing their plans because of lockdown, etc. So they have found out that more than 80% people who had a plan of buying all these things, they are postponing their plans of purchasing all those things at least for six months. Therefore, all these industries, to, to tourism and travel industry, automobile industry, uh, this uh, consumer durable industries, this construction sector, they are going to face huge demand problem in coming six months for sure. So uh, this demand, under this demand depression, there was a, a suggestion. In fact, uh, many people have made these suggestions, including Professor Vijit Banerjee that there should be cash transfers or direct benefit transfers to the common people of this country in order to compensate for their income losses so that their purchasing power uh, don't you know doesn't go down and uh, the aggregate demand remains intact but uh, there was no such thing uh, done uh, what we have witnessed is the following that is there were two government packages one was Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan package, 
which was announced in March. And later on, there was this Atma Nirbhar Bharat package, which was announced in uh, April. So uh, uh, now, uh, April or May, I'm forgetting. Anyway, uh, so in these two packages, as far as uh, PM GKY package is concerned, there were three concrete promises made. One is uh, there would be free ration to uh, everybody, five kg of wheat or rice and one kg of dal per family per month. Uh, and there would be 500 rupees per month direct benefit transfers to the bank accounts of the uh, Jandhan account holders. And the third was there will be free gas cylinders uh, uh, during the lockdown. And there were other, some other promises, but they were meant only for the organized sector workers and so on and so forth. Uh, in the uh, Atma Nirbhar Bharat package, uh, I was calculating the numbers out of 10.3% of GDP amount of package, uh, hardly 1.3% of GDP amount was fiscal stimulus and the rest was monetary measures. They were either in terms of uh, the infusion of liquidity into the commercial banks and the financial institutions by some of the measures taken by the Reserve Bank of India. They reduced the cash reserve ratio. They reduced the repo rate and uh, made the liquidity easier and so on and so forth. And uh, that was something around 8 lakh uh, crore or 4% of GDP. And uh, along with that, government encouraged uh, MSMEs, uh, small and medium scale enterprises and the farmers to take loans from the banks and commercial uh, uh, commercial banks and the some lending institutions in easier terms without any collateral government would give guarantee and uh, so that they get encouraged and they take loans from those uh, financial institutions so together they were uh, coming out to be something around uh, almost uh, 8 to 9% of uh, gdp which was part of the Atmanirbhar Bharat package. Now, I would like to argue, I was uh, looking at recent data, and I would like to argue that this package, which is uh, hardly fiscal, uh, mainly uh, monetary measures, this package in this situation would not be able to stimulate the economy because the data shows that credit deposit ratio of all commercial banks taken together have started falling since the lockdown has taken place. And so when credit deposit ratio is falling, that means demand for credit is actually lower than the deposit base with the commercial banks. So when the credit deposit ratio is falling, then this liquidity infusion would not possibly uh, uh, increase automatically the credit offtake from the banks. The second reason is, uh, these uh, MSMEs and the farmers, they have been encouraged to take loans from the banks. However, until and unless they see profitable opportunity, enough demand for the product they produce, uh, uh, they would not make investment or they would not expand their existing level of stock of capital. So what they would do probably, they would take these loans in easier terms, which are collateral free with government guarantee, and they would substitute their past loans with these loans. And uh, as a result of that, the aggregate demand or aggregate investment or aggregate non-food credit offtake as proportion of GDP is not going to go up because of these financial stimulus which government is expecting uh, 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 the econ uh, to boost the economy uh, through these uh, financial inclusion. These are welcome measures. However, these are not enough. So many people were arguing that there should be a fiscal stimulus which can enhance the purchasing power of people and which can solve the aggregate demand problem. But uh, nothing of that sort was uh, done in Atmanajar Bharat package. Now, uh, I would like to uh, emphasize one or two more things. That is, uh, we all know that Kerala uh, uh, has done relatively better as compared to many other states in tackling both health situation as well as the economic problem uh, under this COVID lockdown. 
so uh, what has happened is uh, first of all i am working on kerala economy since 2006 and i know the economy closely what they have which is not there in the other states is a process of planning they have a proper functional planning board and the, the there are district planning offices and there is a functional process of planning which is missing in most of the states in india today second is they have decentralization and community participation as a result of that they could uh, uh, you know have community kitchens they could have uh, uh, implementation of policies at grassroots levels or at much more efficient manner and uh, of course they have a uh, left of the center views political views which has helped the poor to survive uh, even the migrant workers to survive uh, in the state of kerala as compared to other states many other states now i am conducting one to understand the impact economic impact of lockdown in india i am conducting one telephonic survey in 15 states in india with the help of my friends and the, i have received uh, results from five six states and the data shows that uh, not only these migrant workers, but two third of the workers, they have they are suffering from extreme fear, they of joblessness. They don't have any jobs, or they are earning uh, less than half of what they used to earn before in before lockdown situation. Some industries like tourism industry, etc. North Bengal, I have surveyed. Uh, in North Bengal, tourism is very important, uh, as it is important in Rajasthan and uh, in Himachal Pradesh and in Kerala. So tourism industry, they are expecting that for next one year, no tourist would uh, go to those tourist spots just for fun. Uh, so the tourism industry is huge industry. For some states, they, uh, the contribution of tourism is significant uh, in terms of GSDP as well as in terms of employment. So if that suffers badly, then there will be a lot of huge employment loss. And uh, there, the uh, entertainment industry is another industry. Nobody is going to go to movie theaters to uh, watch films or uh, theaters or dance performance or the uh, musical performance. So entertainment industries, those who are involved in entertainment industries, they are uh, having a bad time. Then uh, uh, many people, they don't know we were asking this question that uh, uh, what is your expectation about the future stream of income in next six months so uh, most of the people more than uh, half of the people are saying that they don't know but it is extremely uncertain and uh, many are saying that their income would come down uh, by at least by half of what they used to earn before in before lockdown situation so this is the situation in the country as far as growth prospects are concerned some people are rbi has said that there would be negative growth some people are saying that uh, there would be minus two percent growth minus three percent growth now even if we assume that in the first quarter of this fiscal year that is in the month of april may and june the gdp has come down at least by half of uh, what it was in the first quarter of last year then that means annualized growth rate negative growth rate of 12.5 percent in one quarter 50 percent uh, negative growth rate means uh, in one year it would be 12.5 percent and on top of that in the next quarter suddenly all the activities are not going to become normal so it would become normal gradually therefore in the second quarter also there would be negative growth rate there would be in, in the third quarter also there would be negative growth rate so i don't know nobody knows we don't have aggregate level data as of now but my suspicion is that the growth rate would be in indian economy in this fiscal current fiscal year would be minus 15 to minus 22 percent anywhere between negative 15 to 22 percent if that happens then unemployment would also given the productivity unemployment would also rise by 15 to 20 percent now if that happens then obviously law and situ order situation would go beyond control out of hands because a lot of people before uh, i mean either they may commit suicide or they may uh, die a starvation death or uh, they may die out of some other disease because of lack of immunity and because of lack of food but uh, at the same time uh, some people 
uh, would become criminals probably in fact many people those who were workers earlier maybe casual workers maybe small uh, workers but those who were workers earlier they have become almost like beggars now and some of them uh, might become anti social elements as well so uh, in this kind of a distress like situation government has to take proactive role we were asking people that how many of them have got this free ration free gas cylinder and free and jandhan uh, jandhan account money now uh, as far as uh, free ration is concerned lot of people 80 to 90% people have received free ration however as far as jandhan uh, money 500 rupees per month or gas cylinder is concerned 80 to 90% people in most of the states did not get it uh even after 3 months of the announcement of pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana which was announced in march and this is end june so government has to uh, play a proactive role as far as the suggestions or solutions are concerned i was suggesting when suggestions are coming up from the ground one suggestion is of course cash transfer until and unless this cash transfer is done to a substantial ex- extent this purchasing power cannot be protected and therefore aggregate demand cannot be protected and uh, there would not be investment enough investment to absorb the labor force unemployment would rise uh, poverty would rise and inequality would rise and and, 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 and i mean crores of people would suffer badly uh, second is uh, my suggestion was universalize mg nrgs it is as of now it is meant only for the rural areas but as i was arguing more than 50% 50 crore people are living in urban uh, areas in india so uh, until and un- they don't have any job security until and unless there is a some minimum uh, you know employment guarantee or some employment of last resort program for them uh, if they don't get a- a- employment otherwise where would they go what would they do so it's extreme vulnerability in that situation government must universalize the mg nrgs program and along with that i think mg nrgs average wage rate is pegged at 202 rupees per day which should be enhanced to 350 rupees which is the minimum wage rate of agricultural laborers for rural india and 450 rupees which is the minimum wage norm for industrial workers in the urban a- areas these are all government norms so uh, mg nrgs wages also should be made at par with those minimum wage norms in rural and urban areas the third suggestion which i had in mind is the health expenditure health infrastructure is clearly not enough and during covid we have seen how the private uh, hospitals have made money and how hugely they are charging it is just impossible for the poor people for the 70 to 80 percent of our population to get themselves treated in the private hospitals because of the very high charges. So government has to let there be private hospitals, but government has to uh, intervene in this sector. And uh, if I remember correctly, uh, in national common minimum program, which was drafted in 2003 or 2004, 15 years, 20 years back almost, 15 to 16 years back, that time, uh, uh, I mean, there was a consensus. that our health expendi government health expenditure including central government and state government expenditure should be increased to 3% of gdp which is currently less than 1% of gdp that time also it was less than 1% of gdp interestingly in china also before 2000 it was uh, the government health expenditure was less than 1% of gdp which they have gradually increased to more than 3% of gdp today but we could not we are still there we are still spending less than 1% of gdp on health this is one of the lowest in the whole world it's a matter of shame international shame that out of pocket expenditure here in india on health is one of the highest and government health expenditure to gdp ratio is one of the lowest in india i was looking at data of 200 countries there would be hardly 10 countries Uh, where government spends less on health as proportion of gdp than in india so there is a need as well as uh, i mean it's a long pending demand that health expenditure should be enhanced substantially 
which would uh, solve the healthcare problem as well as it would solve the demand problem also because if people's out of pocket expenditure on health reduces then people would have more purchasing power to demand for other commodities and services which would solve the demand problem to some extent so uh, these are the things which i had in mind now i would like to stop here and uh, take some questions maybe thank you very much for your attention yeah thank you sir uh, th that was indeed educating and uh, you touched so many different aspects uh, so many things were so much revealing that the uh, migrant workforce is around 34 to 35 crores so you know uh, the, or or you know current population estimated it will be adjusted to 44 crores that are really huge numbers right yeah. and uh, you also uh, talked about like some of the industries how it will be affected in in case of like entertainment or uh, maybe uh, tourism. Uh, tourism right so uh, some of the questions are here uh, one question is uh, what will be the allocation of work for the urban people uh, in universalization of nrga what That's kind of work what will be the allocation of work for the urban people in yeah. universalization urban. of NREGA? What kind of work that uh, urban local bodies have to formulate? The policy has to be designed accordingly. Obviously, uh, the, uh, the kind of work in which are there in rural areas, in urban areas, work could be different. But uh, I am not an expert to formulate, to design all those programs. But... Uh, there are many work which can be allocated to uh, the urban unemployed people by the government. And uh, maybe for infrastructure development, maybe for uh, other things. So uh, there are a lot of gaps. It's a developing country. So, uh, I mean, uh, there is no dearth of work. If government plans properly, uh, they can allocate people uh, in various works in urban areas as well for the overall development okay okay so there is another question sir hmm. is there any predefined process for cash transfer there is no predefined process but uh, uh, we were suggesting how to do it how to reach out to the poor and uh, needy uh, in fact uh, government has the data of 13 crore more than 13 crore mg nrgs workers uh, and data on their bank accounts and everything so they are job card holders. So government, if wanted, they easily could have uh, spent some uh, cash transfers to these bank accounts of the MG and RGS workers. And 13 crore rural people means if we, uh, since there is only one worker or job card holders from each family in rural India, uh, it would have covered, and if the average family size happens to be five, then it would have covered probably 60 to 61 crore people in the country. Then Jandhan account, I think uh, 40 crore Jandhan accounts are there, but uh, money is not going. I mean, money is not sent to all the accounts as far as uh, our primary survey results are saying that even after three months, most of the Jandhan account holders didn't get, didn't receive any money. So that has to be expedited. Then uh, these farmers' uh, accounts are there. Now government has collected the data on farmers because in the last budget, uh, I think before election, that interim budget it was promised that there are 6,000 rupees would be transferred to the farmers' accounts. So those bank account details are there with the government. And they would not cover a lot of others who are also poor and needy. We were suggesting that nowadays it is possible to take the photograph of some identity card, either Aadhaar card or voter identity card or ration card or something with a smartphone and send it to the government if they want any help with the, their bank account details. And government can, it's a, I mean, it would take, it requires some computer programming for double checking, etc. whether uh, more than one person is claiming money from the same family or not to check that. And government also has the data of direct taxpayers. So they can be, their families can be excluded and others could have been covered. So designing and formulating all these things, you know, conceptually it is possible. We need some experts. We need to form some committees 
who can actually do these things but it is perfectly doable and a lot of other countries are doing it i mean may not be substantially high but even in uh, united states people have got uh, i think thousand dollars or something in the initial month of lockdown then uh, there are huge cash transfers programs in latin american countries mexico and brazil and so on so uh, it's perfectly possible and doable uh, okay okay uh, thank you sir so uh, for the sake of time uh, let us not take uh, further questions and uh, may i now request once again uh, dr uh, srijatha bishesh convener of this webinar to formally close uh, day one's uh, session thank you at the end of today's session of the webinar it is time to offer the vote of thanks we thank our renowned speakers mrs priyan datta from berkshire uk professor omlan chakraborty from university of calcutta and dr shurujit das from jnu for their informative and illuminating lectures we thank our distinguished delegates and all participants for their keen interest and active participation we have two more lectures in tomorrow's session from 7 pm and we hope that we will be equally enriched by the talks to be delivered tomorrow thank you all and good night thanks a lot ma'am thank you thank you very much yeah thanks everyone we are closing the call